Hello great people of YouTube, today I'm talking about Paper Towns by John Green. This has been on my shelf for about two years, but since last weekend I was sick and just wanted some sort of light YA, I thought it would be the perfect time to read it. Also, the movie is being filmed now. So this is about a nice normal boy named Q and his two best friends, Ben and Radar. It's set in a typical high school suburban background and they're about three weeks away from graduation. But Q's neighbour is the enigmatic Margot. And one night she climbs into Q's bedroom and on this one night together they go on this epic tale of revenge around the neighbourhood and the next day she's not in school. Marco's always full of crazy stories about disappearing for days at a time and joining the circus or just going to another city. But since this is the day after Q has reconnected with her, he's really concerned and wants to understand why she's done it. In the wake of her disappearance, she's left a trail of clues and Q thinks that she wants him to find her. So besides this from John Green, I have read Tiffios and Looking for Alaska and I found it really hard to escape the John Greenness of it. From watching Vlogbrothers videos for like years, I was constantly thinking about the characters in reference to why John's chosen them, blah 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 blah. And that was difficult to escape, but I think I got past it eventually, I hope. <laughs> I thought the characters were really interesting, I thought it was fun, I thought the narrative was interesting, I thought it was well paced, but mostly, I really, I loved the essence, I loved what it left you with. And this is my new favourite John Green book. I want to start by talking about the allure of the mystery girl. It almost falls into the manic pixie dream girl trope, but not really, because Margot isn't really a means to an end. But she sure does start off that way, and I harbour a deep hatred for that type of character. This is probably just a pet peeve of mine, but I really dislike the fact that mystery is alluring. Because more often than not, it's just a slew of bad traits masquerading as alluring. And as a not very mysterious girl, I'm so irked by the fact that, like, men wouldn't find me attractive because I'm not mysterious enough and that's just not an attainable thing. It sort of reminds me of that Lizzie McGuire episode where she changes herself so that Ethan Craft will like her and then she just realised that this is not her, she's not a mysterious person. So the fact that for most of this book Q is pining after this girl just because she doesn't really understand her um, just really irked me. But then I got over myself a little bit and as it goes on I think she does get less sort of fancifully mysterious and then I could deal with it a lot better. Q's parents are both therapists and there's this discussion where they're talking about how to understand other people because Q just said that this guy at school was an asshole and his mum says but Chuck has learning difficulties he has all kind of problems just like anyone. I know it's impossible for you to see peers that way but when you're older you'll start to see them the bad kids and the good kids and all the kids as people. And then the next page Q's thinking about those ideas and he says, Chuck Parson was a person, like me. Margot Ross Spiegelman was a person too. I never quite thought of her that way, not really. It was a failure of all my previous imaginings, all along, only since she left, but for a decade before I've been imagining her without listening. I could not imagine her as a person who could feel fear, who could feel isolated in a room full of people, who could be shy about her record collection because it was too personal to share, someone who might read travel books to escape having to live in the town that so many people escape to. Someone who, because no one thought she was a person, had no one to really talk to. That was really the grounding moment which switched my perspective on the whole mystery girl thing because it took Margot from that trope and really regained her as a proper character. And I think from then on Quentin treats her as a person and then in the narrative she becomes one. I think when you're growing up and when you're leaving school, there's this moment where you feel like you're standing on the edge of an abyss and you realise that suddenly you make all of the choices in your life because up to then you didn't really, you were just kind of put through school and went about the world and just fell into these categories that other people put you in. I remember that moment for me really specifically. We'd finished our exams a couple of days before and in a few days time was our final leavers ball but one night we had a prefect's house dinner and then we were all going to sleep over in the head of house's room and 13 girls sleeping in a room that's made for one doesn't really work. I was very uncomfortable and I woke up at about three o'clock and just decided I'm gonna drive home. I have a car, I have the keys to my house, I'm just gonna leave. So it was about four o'clock in the morning and I was driving down this road and could feel the sort of sun coming up and the birds singing and I decided to go a sort of windy route back so that I could go by the fields and I stopped on this dirt road um, and sat on this fence that overlooked this cornfield and you could see the most amazing sunrise and I sat there and I thought this is this is a profound moment isn't it? This should mean a lot and then it did. I realised it did. I suddenly felt like I had the world, like I was just driving home when I wanted to and I didn't have to go to school every day anymore and it was terrifying but it was amazing because suddenly 
everybody becomes a person because everybody gets to make those decisions. It's not only you. I think the same point in time when you start understanding yourself, you start understanding other people as individuals as well. And you see them for much more than these characteristics that you label them throughout school or whatever. I think Margot's such an enigma because that happened to her long before she left high school. She already knew that she was different and was going to do something different and had accepted that. And that didn't fit into the world that all of her friends occupied where they were just, you know, thinking about exams and graduating and going off to college. Margot has already grown up and you see the other characters of these books, Q and his friends, it's at the moment of their graduation where they get to make a choice and they ascend to adulthood and suddenly they've grown up as well. My flatmate is doing her dissertation on suburbia, which has given me a much more sensitive maybe critical eye towards it. I think the suburban lifestyle talked about in this book is kind of a dichotomy. On the one hand, it's very permanent. You're always going to have high school and the jocks and the parents and the cars and the estates, but also it's so temporary. And all the estates talked about in this are so new and anonymous and changeable. In particular, Q goes and visits these subdivisions, which were laid out plans for new residential areas that were never built. And it's so poignant that any one of them could have been the one that you would have lived in and yours could never have been built. The changeability of your whole living situation is so trivial. It's so trivial. There are hundreds of cities with hundreds of suburban areas that millions of kids live in and they're all going through the same lives and it's so oppressively normal. <laughs> this is what Margot says. From here you can't see the rust or the crack paint or whatever but you can tell what the place really is. You can see how fake it all is. It's not even hard enough to be made out of plastic. It's a paper town. I mean, look at it, Q. Look at all those cul-de-sacs, those streets that turn in on themselves, all the houses that were built to fall apart, all those paper people living in their paper houses, burning the future to stay warm. When Margot realizes that she's living in this metaphorical paper town and becoming a paper person, she just finds it unbearable. Like, she's not a person that can handle that. And I'm wondering, is that unbearable to everybody? Do you think if you live that life and if you're aware of it, you can't stand it because you feel so anonymous? In Paper Towns, it feels like nobody is aware of this fact and everybody just goes along with their lives and it's only Margot that when she's recognised it, wants to escape. But then, you know, when Quentin finds out, he's perfectly happy to sort of go and live life in this paper town being a paper person. So that's my question to you. Is it bearable to live as a paper person? Is it just a small section of adventurous people that need to escape that? Please tell me your thoughts on this. That got kind of deep, I'm sorry. This has been Paper Towns by John Green. I really enjoyed it. I hope you have enjoyed this video. I hope you've read the book. If you haven't read the book, do you want to read the book? Just, yeah. Bye. <laughs>